Hi, thank you so much for inviting me to be, to be a part of the Karachi conference. It's a very big honor for me and I'm grateful to my friend Romana Hussain for suggesting my name. My topic is the Amuls of Karachi. So I'm going to be telling you about what Karachi was like when the Amuls were important citizens there. Today's Karachi, I don't know. I have visited twice and I have very happy memories of the times I spent with my friends there. But what I'm going to tell you about today is the stories that are very much in my mind from the interviews that I've done with many people who grew up in Karachi and lived there. And they describe it to me as a very beautiful place, one of the cleanest cities in India at that time, the largest international airport, modern place, uh, a lot of culture, beautiful architecture, and a great commitment to education. So what I'm going to do is share those stories with you and hope that um, you'll be able to see those things that they've shown me. Let me start with this family photograph. Here you see Mena and Chatur Singh Advani. The year is 1929 and they are recently married. Next to them are Chatur Singh's sisters Parvati and Chaturi and their brother Sundar. As it happens, Chatur Singh was the youngest partner in a successful trading agency named M.G. Shahani and Company, founded by a gentleman named M.G. Shahani in Karachi. The other partners were Shiva Nadwani, Chatur Singh Advani, and Lake Raj Sipahi Malani. All were Amils. They imported perfumes, creams, handkerchiefs, ovaltine, jelly, cheese, and other popular domestic products. I suppose they were luxuries for the time. Sadly, Chatur Singh died in 1940. He was 40 years old. His widow Mena was 32. She was left with three children, Sarla who was nine, Nirmala who was eight, and Chandur just six. This brave lady made important financial decisions herself and took care of her children, saw them through the difficult time of partition, educated them and arranged for their marriages. In this photograph, you see the family of Gulab Rai Malkani, taken in Karachi, probably around 1938. They are posing for this formal photo outside their home, Guli Villa, Amil Colony No. 2, which I believe still exists somewhere in Karachi. The photo was given to me by Gulab Rai's grandson, Ashok, who was born in 1940 and thereby missed the opportunity of being in this photo. Despite the disruption and trauma following partition, which caused many Sindhi families to lose track of their family's history. Ashok's mother, Vishni, who you can see seated in the last chair on the right, was particular about handing this information down. She told Ashok that his grandfather, Gulab Rai, was deputy collector of Hyderabad. Or perhaps she said, dipti collector, which is how a lot of people said it in those days. It was the highest rank an Indian could hold and held a great deal of power and prestige. Later, when Divan Gulab Rai retired, he was recommended to the Mir of the princely state of Kherpur as an advisor and to facilitate the relationship between the Mirs and the British administration. Vishni told Ashok that Kherpur was ruled by Mir Fez Muhammad Khan Talpur and that it was her father-in-law, Divan Gulab Rai, who persuaded the Mir to merge his coinage in gold with the British treasury. She remembered the British forces escorting the great wealth from the Pako Kilo in Hyderabad to the government treasury. Nine years after this photo was taken, this family was going to board the SS Netravati of the Bombay Steam Navigation Company and arrive in Bombay as refugees. You'll see from these photos how the Amils of Karachi dressed. The men are wearing these beautifully tailored formal suits imported from England. Even the little boys have ties on and the girls are wearing dresses, all very anglicized. The women, though in Indian clothes, are wearing stylish court shoes imported from Paris. And they are wearing saris, which is not a dress traditionally worn by Sindhi women. 
The lower photo is of the Ramchandani family and most of these men joined the railways and rose to very senior positions. These women are dressed more traditionally. Saris came to Sindh through Karachi. In fact, if you look at the photo with Chatur Singh Advani in the top left corner, you'll see that the ladies are wearing saris with finely embroidered borders and draped the opposite way on the right shoulder as Parsi women wore them. And of course, the Parsis were the social elite of British India. So, the Amils were clearly an aspirational people, clearly very adaptable in the pursuit of their ambitions for lives of comfort and dignity. Because when the British made Sindh the part of the Bombay Presidency and Karachi the capital of Sindh, they brought government servants and professionals from other parts of India. And the Amils rushed in to get their share of employment and recognition. So where did these Amils come from then? To Karachi, they came from Hyderabad, the capital built by the Kaloras. Built, in fact, by the legendary Amil Divan Gidumal for his Kalora masters and from where the Talpurs too ruled. These photographs are from a book called The People of India. I'm going to read the description that accompanies them. The individual seated on the right of the picture is Munga Ram, head Munshi in the office of the Commissioner of Sindh. He had served the Amirs Morad Ali and Nur Muhammad in a confidential capacity for 11 years and for three years preceding the conquest Mir Shahdad Khan. After the conquest, he entered the British service and has risen to his present post. His integrity has been hitherto as unquestioned as his hard work has been unmistakable. He is a very worthy public servant. In the centre of the picture standing is Oda Ram, translator to the Commissioner's Office, who has studied English sufficiently to make him the best Sindhi teacher in the province, and his translations in the general and educational departments are many and popular. The boy on the left is now an English clerk in the Commissioner's Office, who does credit to the Hyderabad English School in which he was educated. The second photograph is of Amils who had risen to the rank of Diwans under the Amirs and are good specimens of the elder grades of the Lohana Amils. The Lohanas, as has been stated previously, are Hindus. Some belong to the Vaishnava, others to the Sivaik sects. It may be said of all that abstract Hinduism sits lightly upon them. Besides Amils or government employees, the Lohana caste have many other occupations. They are found as bankers, dealers in money, merchants, shopkeepers, agriculturists, etc. Their costumes are rich and handsome, and as a class they are well dressed. None wear turbans, but have adopted the usual Sindhi hat or cap, as shown in the photographs. All have adopted the beard and with their dress they are more like Mohammedans than Hindus. So that was the end of the description. These specimens were representative of the early days of the British Empire. As time went by, they used the British educational institutes which gave them opportunities to become lawyers, doctors and engineers and government service was something they'd always excelled in, so they rose in the administration and bureaucracy. If you look at the lists of British institutions like the Inns of Courts or the engineers of the PWD, you will see many Amil names. I must also tell you that though Karachi soon became the place Amils gravitated to for the opportunities and lifestyle they sought, Hyderabad was always going to be their home. Even when they were living in Karachi, even when they were travelling to study or work in England, they would have homes in Hyderabad, their grandmother's homes, their uncle's homes. And when a baby was due, families would make sure that the mother was sent to Hyderabad for its birth, so that the children would always have the stamp of being a Hyderabadi Amil. Many Amils could also trace their ancestry to ministers who worked in the Kalora court of Khudabad and they call themselves Kudabadi Amils. So there was definitely an element of social climbing in being an Amil. 
The most important Amil attribute, however, was the commitment to education. In Hyderabad, as early as 1885, the first school for girls was opened by the Hyderabad municipality. It was funded by donations of 1,500 rupees each from two young Amil men of the Advani clan, Naval Rai and Sahaj Rai. And they named the school Shankiram Chandumal Girls School in honor of their fathers. This photo shows the sons of Shankiram Advani, who was one of the early mukhis or headmen of Hyderabad. You can see how Amils dressed in the time before they came to Karachi. Naval Rai and Hiranand taught at this girls' school without remuneration, and they also brought two lady teachers from Bengal, sisters, to teach here. In fact, the focus on education for girls and a general reform towards creating awareness and upliftment in the oppressed society came from the Brahmo Samaj in Bengal, which was a great influence on Naval Rai, which he passed on to his brother and implemented effectively across Sindh. They opened a number of other schools as well. At that time, there were no institutes of higher education in Sindh, and the upwardly mobile families sent their sons to Bombay, and some even to London to study. But in 1887, the Sindh Arts College came up. And this was the result of constant petitions to the government by a group of people, most of whom were Amils. They contributed funds, and they taught in the schools and colleges they built, and of course they sent their children there to study too. The most important thing I could say about the Amils of Sindh is that they were builders of institutions, not just in Karachi, not just in Sindh, but also after partition. They continue to do this in Bombay, building some of the city's finest educational and healthcare institutes. As you would have noticed, Quite a large percentage of the donors and builders of the college, as well as its past students, were Amals. And in this photo, every one of these lovely young women is from an Amal family. I want to also mention Rupchand Pilaram. He was Judicial Commissioner of Sindh, an absolutely exalted position at the time. There's no one left anymore who has detailed information about him, but his grandsons Sundar and Manu sent me a few photographs. You can see Rupchand Bilaram in this photo towards the right, an elderly gentleman with his white solar topi in his hand. Where this photo was taken, when, or what the occasion was, who the other people in it are, I have no idea. Rupchand Bilaram founded a school in Karachi, the Carniero Indian Girls High School, which was apparently quite a big thing in its day. Some months ago, I read in a Dawn article by Akhtar Baluch that it is the government college for women these days. Here's a token Rupchand Bilaram was given for laying the foundation of the Hyderabadi Amal Cooperative Housing Society in Karachi in 1928. And here's a painting of a park in Clifton, which was given his name, probably in the 1940s. I've heard that the park still goes by the name of Rupchand Pilaram, even though everyone seems to have forgotten who he was. My grandfather became a... When Sid was separated from Mobile Residency, he was made... He and Shah Nivas Bhutto were made the first ministers uh, selected, not elected, selected. And he had to entertain a lot. So he sent for my mother. He said, you, sit, you stay with me in this Karachi house. It was at Clifton. The house had a name. 
for my mother at the house. So in that class, the Sharni was going to go and off. They would visit him in the morning. He'd go for a walk, come back to his house and have a morning cup of tea. And my mother saw to it that it was served. I did used to say, Divan Babu, is she your daughter-in-law or your daughter? She's so clever. You know, what I want to mention here is that the one scene which is so vivid in my mind and which probably there's nobody else alive who's seen it because we were in that particular corner of the sin assembly. As I say, there were two or three or four small houses in a complex. We were in one of them. I know that in another one there was a Parsi family. But no, uh, apart from these two houses along the wall, ours and this maybe this Parsi family's house, there was nobody else who could look into the sin assembly. We were on the first floor. We could have gone to, we did go to the terrace for a while, but there was no other house in this area which saw the carriage come into the sin assembly and progress towards the sin assembly, come into the uh, sin assembly through the gate, through the left side gate. As you face the assembly, the gate must be on the left side because that's where we were, that's where our house was. And come along that little pathway to the red carpet which was spread right across, it was thin red carpet, a few, three, four feet wide, spread right across the Sindh assembly, where Jinnah and his sister were standing. Along with various other people, they seemed, I seem to remember they were, some of them were in uniform, so there was maybe an welcoming team or whatever and as Mountbatten got off Lord Mountbatten and then after him Lady Mountbatten we could see their backs we could see the back of their heads was Jamshedji Quarter Road, I, I'm not sure. At the end of the road was a park where people played cricket. And uh, I'm also told it was not quite army colony, maybe just outside. I'm not too sure about all this. I, I know there were a lot of uh, Muslims staying opposite us. And the two guys I played with, I remember their names so clearly, Manju and uh, Masood brothers and they were staying directly opposite and I still remember this though I paid no attention to it I remember Manju the younger one telling me once we are going to get that house of yours I've come to my last slide a group photo of members of the Sindh Insurance Association taken in Karachi at its first annual general meeting on 28th of March 1947. Looking at these well-dressed, well-educated, prosperous gents, mostly our mills, who could have imagined that in just six months' time their world would have turned upside down? When I was growing up, a child of mixed parentage in India, I was given to understand that Sindhis had two broad communities. Amils and Bhaibans. The Amils were said to be educated, while the Bhaibans were the business families. There was an unspoken understanding that this divide also incorporated a clear social differentiation, which included attributes such as position and power, taste and elegance, and the status of women. As a student and researcher on the Hindus of Sindh, I have since learnt that it's not that simple. A lot of info important information was lost or been neglected. In fact, the Hindus of Sindh 
were a heterogeneous lot, with a few important traits solidly in common. These include the traits that they displayed across the community during partition. Abruptly made homeless and penniless, there was no whining and complaining. Instead, they put all their misery, fear and confusion aside and buckled down to rebuilding their lives. They looked around them and started doing things useful to others which could earn them a living. The amazing thing, made even more amazing by the fact that it has never been applauded as it should have or even noticed, is that it wasn't just one family or group of families who did this. It was the entire community which behaved as one entity in that moment of trauma.